Well, I think a good way to frame Hosea chapter 12 is as Ephraim Israel being depicted as a people who have forgotten who they are. They were set apart as God's covenant people, which not only came with the greatest privileges, but also with serious obligations and responsibilities. And this memory loss happened as a result of walking away from the Torah, the Torah they were given at Mount Sinai, and in its place, adopting a hybrid religion that mixed Baal worship with Jehovah worship. Now, this same thought was written down by Yeshua's brother, James. Jacob, really, that was his name. In James 1, 22 through 25, where it says, Don't deceive yourselves by only hearing what the Word says do it. For whoever hears the word but doesn't do it, doesn't do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, who looks at himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what he looks like. But if a person looks closely into the perfect Torah, which gives freedom, and continues, becoming not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work it requires, then he will be blessed in what he does. Now we only dealt with the first verse of chapter 12 last time, so before we move to verse 2, we're going to reread this short chapter. So open your Bibles to Hosea chapter 12, please. Hosea chapter 12. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 12. Ephraim surrounds me with lies, and the house of Israel with deceit. Judah, Judah, still rules with God, and is faithful with holy ones. Ephraim is chasing the wind, pursuing the wind from the east. All day he piles up lies and desolations. <clears throat> they make a covenant with Asher, while sending olive oil to Egypt. Adonai also has a grievance against Judah. He will punish Jacob according to his ways, and pay him back for his misdeeds. In the womb he took his brother by the heel. In the strength of his manhood he fought with God. Yes, he fought with an angel and won. He wept, he pleaded with him. Then at Bethel he found him, and there he would later speak with us. Adonai Elohe Zephaot. Adonai is his name. So you return to your God. Hold fast to grace and to justice, and always put your hope in your God. A huckster keeps false scales, and he loves to cheat. Ephraim says, oh, I've gotten so rich, I've made me a fortune, and in all my prophets no one will find anything wrong or sinful. But I'm Adonai, your God, from the land of Egypt. Again, I will make you live in tents, as in the days of the established festival. I have spoken to the prophets. It was I who gave vision after vision. Through the prophets I gave examples to show what it would all be like. Is Gilead given to iniquity? Yes, they become worthless. In Gilgal they sacrifice to bulls, therefore their altars are like piles of stones in a plowed field. Jacob fled to the land of Aram. There Israel slaved to win a wife. For a wife he tended sheep. By a prophet Adonai brought Israel up from Egypt, and by a prophet he was protected. Ephraim has given bitter provocation, so the penalty for his bloodshed will be thrown down on him, and his Lord will repay him for his insult. <clears throat> okay, let's briefly review verse 1 first. The way this verse is usually translated in nearly, nearly every Bible version, it has major problems. In fact, it, it's my estimation that the rather traditional mindset of what verse 1 means is well off the mark, even though in a strict, literal, word-for-word -word translation, those interpretations are intellectually honest. Now, as we have seen in earlier lessons, 
because of the often cryptic literary construction of the book of Hosea, full of arcane metaphors and expressions that are relevant primarily to the 8th century BC, a thought for thought approach needs to be employed if we're going to find ourselves trying to pound the meaning of it into a Christian doctrinal mold that was in no way intended by the author. Rather, verse 1 ought to be taken to mean something along the lines of this. And Israel is devoted with respect to El, and with respect to angels is loyal. Now the gist of this better way to understand verse 1 is that Hosea is scolding Israel for their practice of angel worship. Just one more of several ways Israel perverted their worship of God. Now, you can get more details about why the ancient Hebrew words used in this passage takes us in this direction by reviewing last week's lesson. In the end, Hosea's accusation is that Israel venerated an angel that went by the name of El or Bethel or the angel of Bethel and approached this angel as though he was God. Contextually, this thought for thought meaning fits well with what is spoken beginning in verse 4 when the patriarch Jacob's life and his encounters with angels becomes the subject. The idea of this narrative is to draw a stark contrast between faithful Jacob versus the now seriously backslidden nation that he spawned, Israel. Jacob encountered angels, but he didn't worship them as God. In fact, in one instance, he triumphed over an angel and he demanded a blessing for his victory. <coughs> However, when Jacob's descendants of the northern kingdom encountered angels, it seems they actually worshipped some of them also meaning that at least one of these angels accepted their worship, indicating this was a disobedient angel. Now one particular angel that bore the name Bethel is mentioned, and this improper worship of angels was just one more prohibited thing that Israel did that provoked, that provoked Jehovah. Well, in verse 2, Israel is said to be pursuing the wind from the east. In Hebrew, it's Ruach HaChadim. And in the way of thinking of Hosea's era, the east wind was a very hot, dry wind that was terribly uncomfortable and often destructive. The term Ruach, wind, by itself is often used in the Bible as a metaphor for foolishness and for folly. So it is in the sense of foolish and destructive, that we are to understand the use of the term here, east wind. Now the idea that Israel is chasing after this east wind, this destructive wind, comes from Israel's determined effort to secure an alliance with a foreign nation to help them in their on and off wars with, with uh, Judah. They're supposed to seek God for rescue when they're in trouble, certainly not help from pagan Gentiles. <clears throat> in fact, it was a basic premise of the Mosaic Covenant that if Israel would respond to Jehovah by obeying the Torah, then in return, Jehovah would be their protector from virtually all dangers. And this obedience meant that they were not to enter into another covenant that didn't involve God. In other words, making a covenant in the form of a treaty, that's what a weaker nation does when it agrees to an alliance and so protection from a stronger nation. Israel was foolish in their thoughts and in their actions because what they were attempting was virtually impossible. This impossibility is expressed in the thought of chasing the wind, because chasing the wind 
It's an illusion. We can never touch the wind, let alone catch it. This passage, therefore, paints Israel as persistently stupid. In the second half of verse 2, nearly every English Bible translation says that Israel made a covenant with Assyria, but such translations miss the point. The word used does not translate to Assyria, but rather to Asher. Asher is the national god of Assyria. So the idea here is that in Jehovah's eyes, Israel committed treason against him and against the covenant he had made with Israel in favor of them making a new covenant with a pagan god named Asher. Now even though Israel would have argued otherwise, the Lord saw Israel as having abandoned him and the covenant of Moses and instead turning to Baal, making a covenant of of uh, protection with him. Now this highlights the utter folly of any denomination within Judeo-Christianity believing that we can rewrite or repurpose Holy Scripture in order to create a new religious order that serves their particular mindset or agenda, and then fully expecting that God not only accepts it, but applauds them for it. Ephraim Israel, as I've regularly pointed out, did this precise thing. That's what they did. But it wasn't their intention to become wicked, nor did they think they'd done anything wrong. They deceived themselves into believing that they had the liberty to remake their ancient Hebrew faith as defined by the Torah, into something that was more modern, more suitable to their current circumstances and their desires. Every manner of rationalization for this immoral behavior was offered, no doubt coming from the religious elite, and then the people, like lemmings, followed them over the cliff. Thus, while making the religious leadership the most culpable, God still saw the common people as guilty as well. So this is why earlier in Hosea, God makes it clear that Israel had it in their possession, they had in their possession the written Torah. And they could have consulted it for truth, for righteousness, but they chose instead to embrace the doctrines of their newly formed, hybridized religion, so they decided to accept whatever their leaders told them was truth and righteousness, because they seemed to be benefiting from it. Let those with ears not only hear, but also take action to repent, to seek God by returning to His Torah and to His moral law code contained within it, even if it means losing friends and family over your decision. I mean, Christ Himself said it would very likely come to this for those who follow Him. In Luke 14, verses 25-27, through 27, large crowds were traveling along with Yeshua, and turning, He said to them, If anyone comes to Me and doesn't hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his brothers and his sisters, yes, and his own life, besides, he cannot be my Talmud, my disciple. Whoever does not carry his own execution stake and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, just so we understand, when this verse speaks of hate, it carries an ancient understanding that doesn't mean, like it sounds, it seems to mean, to modern Western ears. In ancient times, Love and hate were all wrapped up in political terms. Okay, they were meant as words that speak of devotion and allegiance or the lack thereof. Often it was applied to a relationship between a king and his people. So to love was to be a devoted and obedient follower, to hate was to not be devoted and obedient. 
And in this New Testament passage we just read in Luke, Yeshua was saying that if one wants to be a worshiper of Jehovah and a disciple of Jesus, then he and his Father must be the focus of their first and greatest devotion and loyalty. If this devotion to Father and His Son meant less loyalty or even dissolving of loyalty to parents or to family, no doubt because this new believer has been told he or she cannot be loyal to God as a Savior and also loyal to them, well then so be it. So this leads us to a crucial question that we're all going to have to face. Every person, every person who is considering adopting and putting into practice the faith of the Bible. The question is this, are we truly devoted to God and to His Son, or are we more devoted to our denomination, to our pastor, to our rabbi, or to our congregational friends, or even to family traditions and demands? Are we truly obedient to God's holy scriptures? Are we more obedient to the man-made doctrines and customs and traditions and celebrations of our chosen religious organization? Western Christianity generally paints a picture of trust in God as being easy and nothing but benefit on every level. But in reality, Christ says, count the cost before you decide, because there will be a cost. Are you adhering to a faith and to a church or a synagogue in which you are asked to suffer no discernible cost? Then that means there might be a problem. Yeshua's cost was the cross. He says, our cost is to be essentially the same. Well, the final words of this verse that speak of sending oil, that's olive oil, to Egypt is meant as saying that Ephraim Israel is attempting to woo Egypt as an ally in case Assyria doesn't want their allegiance. That is, Israel was trying to keep its options open. Now that might be a sound political policy for a nation in most cases, but not when that nation's existence is based on a covenant between them and God. The God of the Bible is a God of exclusivity. Now verse 3 is problematic because we once again find mention of Judah. Judah simply doesn't fit. This entire prophecy is directed towards Ephraim, Israel, not towards Judah. So it seems most likely that this is a gloss added some years later by a prophet in Judah who saw how accurate Hosea's prophecy of Israel turned out to be, and he became worried as he saw Judah descending into that same morass and deception that Ephraim had succumbed to. So he added these words of warning to his Judean brothers. Now there's no way I, at all to be 100% certain about this. Either way, it does no harm really. In the grand scheme of things, what we can notice is that the name of Jacob is employed here as a synonym for Israel. The name Jacob is used in a couple of different ways in the Bible. It can be used to refer to the patriarch, Jacob, as an individual, or it can be used as an alternate name for the nation of Israel. Now this verse speaks of a controversy or maybe a grievance or a dispute, let's say, that God has against Israel. Now the Hebrew word used is reev, and reev is usually reserved for a legal proceeding. So to help us understand through our 21st century lenses what this is speaking about, we need to think of it as a lawsuit. A lawsuit. Yehovah is figuratively bringing a legal proceeding, a lawsuit, 
against Ephraim Israel for their crimes against him. He's putting Israel on trial. God is both the plaintiff and he's the judge. So in verse 4, Hosea reaches back to long before the covenant of Moses, before there ever was a nation of Israel, and he interjects the life and career of Jacob as an example of the relationship between Israel and God that he had intended, that God had intended. Why do this? Well, it's probably to remind Ephraim who they were, since they seem to have forgotten their history, their reason for existence, their purpose in this world. And to do this, God begins with reminding Israel where they got their name. <clears throat> so in the first half of verse 4, Jacob is spoken of when he was still in his mother's womb. And in the second half of when he had grown up into an adult. The first half harkens back to a statement made in the Torah in Genesis 25. In Genesis 25 verses 22 through 26 we read this, The children fought with each other in inside her so much that she said, If it's going to be like this, why go on living? <clears throat> so she went to inquire about Anai, who answered her, There are two nations in your womb. From birth they will be two rival peoples. One of these peoples will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. And when the time for her delivery came, there were twins in her womb, and the first to come out was reddish and covered all over with hair like a coat. So they named him Esau, completely formed, that is, having hair already. Then his brother emerged with his hand holding Esau's heel. So they called him Yaakov, Jacob. He catches by the heel. Itzhak, Isaac, was sixty years old when she bore them. So he wasn't a very young papa. Now Jacob's name is interesting and is actually somewhat of a play on words. As Esau was emerging through the birth canal, Jacob is said to have reached up and grabbed hold of his twin brother Esau's Akeb, Akeb, his heel. And as a result, Jacob was given the name Yaakob. Akeb, Akob are spelled the same in Hebrew. Only the vocal pronunciations are different. This is why some translators say Jacob's name means heel catcher. However, in time, what it came to mean was he will cheat. Now, even though it can be a little challenging to grasp the meaning of Jacob's name, this much I know. No one would intentionally name their child, he will cheat. So for Jacob's parents, that name certainly meant something else a little more honorable. Now because this birth of the twins, Jacob and Esau, occurred perhaps around 1600 to 1700 BC, before the Hebrew language had been fully formed and then separated away from the other Semitic languages, very likely <clears throat> this name was taken from an earlier and more established Semitic language. And very interestingly, a name that has actually been found written on ancient pottery shards. It is Yaqub Il. It means, may God protect. In other words, even though Jacob's birth name at the time he was given probably meant, may God protect, the traditional story of his birth and then later what happened between he and his brother Esau eventually resulted in a different meaning to his name being applied later on that best reflected a couple of key events in Jacob's life. As Genesis 27-36 demonstrates, Jacob was going to cheat his brother with the result being, one could say, 
that Jacob would supplant Esau as the firstborn, thus receiving all the blessings that come with that firstborn status. Genesis 27 through uh, verse 36. Esau said, his name, Yaakov, really suits him because he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And here, now he's taken away my blessing. Then he asked, haven't you saved a blessing for me? All of that said, nothing in Hosea leans towards calling Jacob a cheater. Rather, it simply recalls the tradition of Jacob grabbing the heel of his twin brother Esau as they were being born. So we've got to be careful not to color this as somehow disparaging of Jacob. Quite the opposite is actually happening here. <clears throat> the second key event in Jacob's life that is mentioned in the fourth verse is provided in detail for us in, back in Genesis 32. And it regards this contact he has with an angel. Now before we discuss this passage, I, I want to read this story in uh, Genesis 32. If you want to take a moment and get there, turn over to Genesis 32. I'd like you to read this along with me. We're going to start at verse 23. So you're going to go to Genesis 32, and we're going to start reading at verse 23. Okay, he, that's Jacob, got up that night, took his two wives, his two slave girls, and his eleven children, and he forded the Yabok. He took them and sent them across the stream, then sent his possessions across, and Yaakov, Jacob, was left alone. Then some man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he did not defeat Jacob, he struck Jacob's hip socket so that his hip was dislocated while wrestling with him. And the man said, let me go because it's daybreak. But Yaakov replied, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And the man asked, what's your name? And he answered, Yaakov. And the man said, from now on you will no longer be called Yaakov, but Israel because you have shown your strength to both God and men and have prevailed. And Yaakov, Jacob, asked him, Please tell me your name. But he answered, Why are you asking about my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob called the place Peniel, face of God, because I have seen God face to face, yet my life is spared. And as the sun rose upon him, he went on past Peniel, limping at the hip. This is why to this day the people of Israel do not eat the thigh muscle that passes along the hip socket because the man struck Jacob's hip at its socket. So, now I want you to please think back to how we opened today's lesson about the better way to translate the first verse of Hosea chapter 12 as having to do with angel worship. Hebrew versions of Hosea 12.4 will sometimes say that Jacob strove with a divine being, a divine being. That is, rather than translating the Hebrew word Elohim as God, as nearly all English versions tend to do whenever the word appears in the Bible, they understand from Genesis 32, it wasn't God in the flesh per se that Jacob wrestled with. And when we read Genesis 32 through our modern eyes, it can be confusing because the Hebrew word used to describe who Jacob wrestled with is Ish. And Ish means a male, a man, a man, flesh and blood. And yet, the context makes no sense if this was just a regular human being because Jacob understood this man to be something different. He says, because I have seen God face to face. Further, the Hebrew words used to describe this being in later parts of this Genesis passage are El and Elohim. Now the reality is that the words El and Elohim are at times synonymous terms that can at one moment speak of God the Creator, the God of Israel. The next speak, speak of beings 
with superhuman abilities and power, and yet other times, the term can mean angels. Here's what we have to attempt to understand, and yes, it is challenging. See, Jacob was trying to make sense of this weird wrestling match. But he was dealing with something that was beyond his experience and beyond his intellectual grasp. Beyond any known words or vocabulary. So he only had common terms at his disposal to try to communicate what he saw, to communicate what occurred, try to relate who this being was. And as we learn from other parts of Jacob's life, such as when he went to Mesopotamia to find a wife and then lived there for a couple of decades with his father-in-law, the spiritual world was a mystery to him. So he, he took many things he heard and saw in terms of the spiritual world as it was comprehended by most Middle Eastern, most Middle Eastern people, no matter their precise religion or exact nationality. It was a spiritual world of demons and angels and divine beings of all sorts and of many gods. See, things were not so cut and dried, so black and white, so easily labeled as modern Christianity at times tries to define them, trying to remove as much mystery as possible from the Bible in order to create concrete answers to everything. And we must also take note That is, the Old Testament prophets tend to do, when referring to Scripture, they at times paraphrase, or they merely allude to a well-known past event, but they don't actually quote a specific Scripture passage. That's the case here. As Hosea isn't intending to quote Scripture, but rather is only trying to remind Israel of two events that were well known to them their remembrance handed down through the generations by means of their traditions. So, Hosea says that first, Jacob won the battle, and then Hosea says, and he wept as he pled with his angel. Yet the idea that Jacob won a contest with his divine being is, as reported, isn't supported in the Torah as Genesis 32 does not speak of a winner and a loser. In fact, the battle only ended, how? When the divine being dislocated Jacob's hip. You decide who won, who lost. Nor does Genesis make any mention of Jacob weeping. So even more, in verse 5 of Hosea chapter 12, Hosea specifically identifies this being not as a man, and certainly not as God nor as some generic divine being, but rather he says that he was an angel, a malach. We must pay close attention to the insertion of the word malach, angel, in this verse, because it has everything to do with Hosea's complaint of Israel worshiping a specific angel, thus answering, uh, rather uh, angering God. Now, continuing in verse 5, notice that Hosea says that it was at Bethel where later this angel would, he says, what is his words? He says, speak with us. So this angel would speak with us. Pause for a second and ponder what's being said here. Hosea was connecting this angel to Jacob back in Jacob's era, hundreds of years earlier, the one Jacob wrestled with, but at the end of the verse says, this same angel spoke to us at Bethel. That is, this angel, this malach, spoke to the people of Israel during Hosea's era. Now clearly, God's prophet Hosea does not think this being Jacob wrestled with and was now speaking with the people of Israel at Bethel was actually God himself. Nor did Hosea cast this angel 
as a special manifestation of God called the angel of the Bi- uh, angel of the Lord we read about in the Bible the Malach Yehoveh and by the way virtually every competent English and Hebrew Bible version reads the same so it's not as though there are different thoughts on how to interpret this verse it's a matter of taking it for what it says rather than trying to apply modern Christian thinking to an ancient Hebrew event that of itself has little clarity. Now I want to quote Gruber because I think after all this that I've told you, he just gets to the bottom line of it. He says, indeed, the prophet's point, it's Hosea's point, is the, that the problem is not that long ago Jacob revered an angel over who he, Jacob, had prevailed, but rather that his descendants still rely on that same angel and there compromise their loyalty to the God of Israel. That's the issue. And I think he's nailed it. I think this understanding of angel worship by Israel is well vindicated with what is said in the next two verses, verses 6 and 7. And I'm going to read them all together. So Hosea 12, verses 6 and 7, take a look at it, reads like this. Adonai Elohei Zephaot, Adonai is his name. So you return to your God, hold fast to grace and justice, and always put hope in your God. Now the King James Version and most other English Bible translations say it slightly differently. They say, Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Therefore turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. Now truly, any of these translations that I've just read to you blatantly leave out words and or change words, change them to suit their denominational beliefs. For instance, Notice how the word even appears at the beginning of the King James Version. This is translating the Hebrew wa or va, and in modern English it more means but. But is in however. However. Even is a very old 15th century word that we don't even use it today. It was meant back then. But notice in the complete Jewish Bible the elimination of any word to start the sentence that translates the Hebrew that's there, va. Here is the more literal translation, Hosea chapter 12, verse 6. But as for Yehovah, the God of hosts, Yehovah is his name. Now we've already discussed it. Israel has been worshiping an angel that went by the name of El or Bethel or the angel of Bethel. Well, El, Bethel, and the angel of the bell, Bethel are not God's name. Therefore, they can't be God. God's formal name is Jehovah. That's how we can know who it is by his name. Exodus 6 3, I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, although I did not make myself known to them by my name. Yudhe Vav or Yehovah. In other words, Israel, you've been worshiping a real being, an angel, but he certainly is not God, so stop it. Stop it. Instead, return to your actual God, return to the true ways and definitions of truth and justice as found in the Torah, and quit putting hope in a powerful angel, and instead put your hope in the only God there is, the only one that can protect you and rescue you, and his name is Yehovah. Now at the risk of sounding offensive, which I probably already have, I really don't mean to be, I'm going to put this forward into modern application. Church, synagogue, stop it! 
Stop worshiping pastors and rabbis. Stop putting your hope in the man-made doctrines they may believe and teach. Stop it. The real God-ordained definitions of grace and justice, which is the indispensable foundation of our faith, these things are found in one place alone, in the Torah. You can go to it, you can read it for yourself, you don't have to rely on what someone in leadership, you don't have to rely on me to tell you it's there. You can read it for yourself. See, what we hear so often today from the pulpit and the bema as truth is not necessarily God's truth at all. But rather, it's a reflection of human desires and agendas and social trends that are all overlaid upon God's truth. Now, it's important to grasp that Hosea is not suggesting to Israel that if they repent and if they return to God, that anything's going to change for them in the short term. The die's cast. Their destruction will not be slowed, and it certainly will not be reversed. But there is an inherent implication that a remnant of Israel will live on. So even though individual Israelites will be born and suffer tragedies and death, some will survive, and they will spawn the next generation. Assyria will attack. They will kill thousands of Israelites. They will besiege their cities. They will starve many to death. And even so, some Israelites will remain alive, and they will endure their exile. Their hope lies not in an immediate national restoration, not going to happen, but rather it lies in an end times future when God will act to bring the land of Israel back under control of the Hebrews and the scattered tribes will return home, no doubt in much diminished numbers. I think what ought to be seen is that it is the modern-day Hebrews who ought to be overjoyed that such a prophesied time seems to have actually finally come. And if it is happening, as it appears to be, then it also means, folks, we have crossed the horizon into the end times. We're there. Well, verses 8 and 9 ought not to be separate verses at all because they just express a single thought. Hosea 12, 8 and 9 reads, A huckster keeps false scales and he loves to cheat. And Ephraim says, I've gotten so rich. I've made me a fortune and all my prophets, no one will find anything wrong or sinful. Now, other Bible versions might say a merchant or a trader. T-R-A-D-E-R. What the Hebrew actually says, though, is Canaanite. Interesting. It says Canaanite. Now, Canaanite, this is a sarcastic nickname that's being hurled at the northern kingdom. It was at first the name for the coastal region of Phoenicia, where they gained fame as traveling merchants, especially so by sea. However, among the Israelites, the hated Canaanites became stereotyped as dishonest businessmen who cheated and they lied in order to make a profit. Now, unfortunately, Israel has become the very thing to hate. So God sees in his own people Canaanite merchants dressed up in Hebrew garb. See, it was a common way for dishonest merchants to make extra profit, profit by using false scales. And there are numerous wisdom sayings in the Bible against the use of false scales to defraud people. The Law of Moses specifically legislates against such a thing. In Deuteronomy 25, verses 13 through 16, you are not to have in your pack two sets of weights, one heavy, the other light. You are not to have in your house two sets of measures, one big, the other small. You are to have a correct and fair weight. 
you are to have a correct and fair measure so that you will prolong your days in the land Adonai your God's giving you. For all who do such things, all who deal dishonestly, are detestable to Adonai your God. Now, while it's not a capital crime, obviously such intentional dishonesty in the marketplace ranks pretty high in God's eyes as to how not to love your neighbor. Yet, in this thievery, what does Ephraim do? Oh, they rejoice, man. They think they're clever. They think they've insulated themselves from troubles by making themselves wealthy through all their dishonesty. They have essentially oppressed others, but now oppression is headed their way. All they have gained is going to become worthless. It's about to become the property of an enemy. See, they're just blind to their own doom. Such terrible behavior reveals their sinful hearts. What they thought was hidden in trivial is laid bare. Let's get a little bit technical for a minute to reveal something that's otherwise hidden when Hosea 12.9 is translated into English. In the Hebrew, there's a hierarchy of, of crimes from the least up to the worst. And we find this principle throughout the Law of Moses. And generally, a crime's seriousness can be expressed by the severity of the, of the penalty for that crime and the level of the sacrifice that has to be offered to atone. So the common Christian mantra that a sin is a sin is a sin, from stealing a loaf of bread to murder, every sin is all the same to God, this is the furthest thing from biblical truth. In Hebrew, the scale of the seriousness of a crime, starting with the least, is hete, then pesa, and finally the worst crime is called abon. Now generally in English, these are rendered in order, sin, transgression, then iniquity. Now what this passage in Hosea tells us is <clears throat> that God sees Israel's dishonesty as avon, iniquity the worst. Now maybe to draw a comparison to something most of us are familiar with, we could say it this way. <clears throat> Israel thought of their own clever dishonesty as a misdemeanor. God judged it as a felony. So in verse 10, Jehovah continues to remind Israel of just who He is and that it is He that Israel should have trusted and not the gods of the pagans. He is the God who rescued Israel from Egypt and led them through the wilderness to the promised land. The land from which God is now ejecting them because of their unfaithfulness to the covenant of Moses. What was for many years a wealthy nation is going to be stripped of their abundance and made as nomads living in tents just as they were when they fled the Pharaoh. Or to put it in modern terms, their standard of living is going to suffer greatly. Nomads have no land. They have no nation, no place to call their own. They live constantly mobile, having only the most minimal of possessions. They will fall from living in the rich neighborhood to being the homeless. That's Israel's fate now. And God says that they will return to like it was when they lived in the days of the appointed time, the Moed in Hebrew. Now, appointed times are the festivals and the holy days, Moedim. But this verse specifically speaks of only one singular, one singular appointed time. No doubt this is referring to Sukkot the Feast of Tabernacles, because it, it connects to living in the temporary shelters, to their living in tents once again, and because Sukkot is considered the grandest of all the biblical feasts. In fact, Sukkot was designed to cause Israel to remember the time when they were living in tents, wandering with no place to call their own. So this reversal of fortune is just part of the reversal of Israel's 
redemption history. Moving on to verse 11. Now, while the complete Jewish Bible translation is not word for word, it very adeptly captures the thought that's being communicated. Israel can offer no excuse for their behavior and should not be surprised by the judgment that's falling upon them because God has warned them through the agency of prophets of what will happen to them if they abandon him in favor of pagan gods. In fact, the meaning is that these prophetic revelations were abundant, not just a few. Many prophets were employed, and they spoke similar, consistent messages of warning and rebuke to Israel over the decades. Therefore, the people's misbehavior is by informed choice. Willful, intentional, not by accident. It's like the exasperated parent that tells his child that he's told him a hundred times not to do something, but the child ignored the instruction and did it anyway. Believers, Gentile or Jew, the words of the prophets, Old and New Testaments, weren't put into the Bible for casual viewing. They are pertinent for us in the 21st century just as they were pertinent to the Hebrews of all the Bible eras. Those words are more than a record of history past for an ancient people. They are also a preview of our future, a future that may already be upon us to some degree. The crimes of the Israelites, they are the same as the crimes of the church and the synagogue. And just like the Israelites of old, Church and synagogue deny it. When the prophets speak, they are speaking to worshipers of the God of Israel. They're not speaking to pagans. Do you understand that? These words they speak that we read, they're speaking them to us. Worshippers, they're not speaking to non-believers. They're not speaking them to pagans. And just like Israel, Church and synagogue have reshaped and repurposed and hybridized the faith of the Bible into something I doubt Jesus would even recognize. God's, God's message is it's a simple one. Repent. Repent and then return to the pure word before it's too late. Return to the moral law code he gave to Moses and believe Christ when he said he did not come to abolish the Torah and the prophets, and that not the slightest change to those commandments, nor our obligation to obey them, would happen until heaven and earth pass away. Look, let go of the secular and pagan religious customs and traditions that have infiltrated and perverted our worship and our practice. You know, otherwise we're going to experience God's judgment instead of His mercy. Well, we'll conclude Hosea chapter 12 and begin chapter 13 next time. Help support God's people by purchasing items made by them. Merchandise with a meaning. Products with a purpose. HolyLandMarketplace.com for more teachings, visit, support, or donate at TorahClass.com. Join with us in worship and enjoy God's Word at Seat of Abraham Fellowship.